In this lecture, we will deal with the most common statistical measures. These measures are used in both descriptive statistics and inferential statistics. John Tukey on descriptive statistics, or exploratory data analysis, as he called it. Exploratory data analysis, descriptive statistics, is detective work, or counting detective work, or graphic detective work. The process of criminal justice are clearly divided between the search for evidence and the evaluation of the evidence's strength, a matter for juries and judges. In data analysis, a similar distinction is helpful. Exploratory data analysis, descriptive statistics, is detective in character. Confirmatory data analysis, inferential statistics, is judicial or quasi-judicial in character. This lecture has six objectives. One, we will review the measures of central tendency. Two, we will review the measures of dispersion. Three, we will cover the measures of skewness. Four, measures of relative position will be covered. Five, we will estimate the mean and standard deviation for group data. Six, Microsoft Excel's descriptive statistics tool will be covered. Let's turn to the six basic measures of central tendency. The mode, mean, median, weighted mean, geometric mean, and trimmed mean. Measures of central tendency depict interpretations of the most typical or central value. All measures of central tendency can be considered a type of average. The value of some measures of central tendency may not be at the center of the data. Let's consider the mode first. The mode measures the most frequently occurring value or values. It can be calculated with nominal, ordinal, interval, or ratio data. Unlike some measures of central location, the mode is not distorted by extreme values, which are called outliers. The mode may not represent the center of the data. Data can have no mode, one mode, or more than one mode. The mode is considered less useful than other measures of central tendency. Here's an example of the mode using M&Ms. Color is a nominal variable. Color frequency is a ratio variable. The mode is the most frequently occurring color. With 16 orange M&Ms in an average bag, orange is the mode because it has the highest frequency. There is no mathematical formula for the mode. To find the mode, simply count the occurrences. With this table of data, the mode is 2 because 2 appears 3 times. 9 is not the mode because it appears only twice. This chart shows that data can have no mode, one mode, or more than one mode. Excel has three mode functions. The first is the mode function. This is one of Excel's original functions. It is useless because it finds only one mode. The second is mode.sngl function. This is a newer function. It too is useless because it finds only one mode. Mode.mult is the third function. This function finds multiple modes. It is an array function. According to Microsoft, array functions are powerful formulas that are enable you to perform complex calculations that often cannot be done with a standard worksheet function. To enter an array function, click on the cell or cells where you want the answer. Enter the formula, press Control, Shift, enter to enter the array formula. Excel will enter braces around the formula. Let's turn to the mean, which is the most important measure of central tendency. The mean, also known as the arithmetic mean, is the most common measure of central tendency. The mean is often called the average, yet all measures of central tendency are averages. The mean is the sum of all the variables over the number of variables. There are four characteristics of the mean. One, the mean requires quantitative data, interval or ratio level data. 
2. A distribution has only one mean. 3. The sum of the deviations from the mean equals 0. This will be important when we calculate measures of dispersion. 4. Outliers distort the mean. The sample mean is symbolized by X bar, while the population mean is symbolized by the lowercase Greek letter mu. X stands for the random variables. The capital Greek letter sigma stands for the operation of addition. The mean equals the sum of all the random variables X over the number of observations in the sample, lowercase n, or the number of observations in the population, uppercase n. Excel's mean function is average. The argument is the cell range. In this table, the weight of lap dogs are listed. John the Maltese weighs six pounds. Paul is a five pound Yorkie. Ringo, a four pound Chihuahua. And George, a seven pound toy poodle. Cell C8 shows the results of the average function. The mean weight is 5.5 pounds. In cell C6, the sum function shows the sum of the four weights, 22 pounds. And in cell C7, the number of variables, 4, is found using the count function. Let's see how the mean is distorted by outliers. We add a fifth dog, Yoko, who is 180 pounds St. Bernard. The mean is now 40.4 pounds. Now suppose that Yoko is not a St. Bernard. She is a 2,200 pound horse. The mean is now 444.4 pounds. Now suppose that Yoko is a 10,000 pound elephant. The mean is now 2,004 pounds. The fact that the mean can be distorted by outliers leads to another very important measure, the median. The median is not distorted by outliers because it is based only on the middle value or values when the data are sorted from smallest to largest. The median should be reported whenever the mean could be distorted by outliers. Measurements of salary, income, housing cost should be reported using the median. The median is symbolized by M, MD, or X tilde. Here is John Tukey's formula for the median. The median is the mean of the two middle values when the number of observations, n, is even. When the n is odd, it is the single middle value. To repeat, the data must be sorted in order of size. Finding the median by hand. Sort the data by size. This can be very time consuming. Find the middle variable when n is an odd number. Take the mean of the two variables surrounding the middle when n is an even number. Excel's median function is much faster than calculating the median by hand because sorting the data is unnecessary. The mean and median weights for the four lap dogs is five and a half pounds. Let's see what happens when we add Yoko. Whether Yoko is a 180 pound St. Bernard, a 2,200 pound horse, or a 10,000 pound elephant, the median remains six pounds. In fact, Yoko could have the mass of an entire galaxy. The median would still be six pounds. The next measure of central tendency is the weighted mean, x bar sub w. With the arithmetic mean, each variable has equal weight. The weighted mean is used when variables have unequal or different weights. The formula for the weighted mean is the sum of the weights w times the random variables x over the sum of the weights. Here is an example using Starbucks Frappuccinos. Here are the sales for Frappuccinos at the outlet on 1313 Main Street for last week. What is the average price per Frappuccino sold? The critical question, what are the weights w? And what are the random variables x? Get this wrong and your answer will be very wrong. The data does give a big hint. The weighted mean cannot be less than $3.95, the price of a toll, or more than $4.95, the price of a venti. Clearly, price is the random variable x, and quantity are the weights. 
The weighted mean, the average price per Frappuccino sold is $4.50. Suppose you confused weights and the random variables. If price were the weights, sigma w would be $13.35 and the weighted mean would be $1,398.31. Clearly this is a mistaken answer, which should cause us to stop and rethink our answer. It is impossible for the average Frappuccino to cost $1,398.31 when the three sizes cost between $3.95 and $4.95. Please note, Excel does not have a weighted mean function. Let's turn to the geometric mean. The geometric mean is used to find the average rate of change over time. This rate can be reported as a decimal, percentage, ratio, or index. Index numbers are very important for calculating the geometric mean. We will review index numbers in detail in the Chapter 6 lecture. The geometric mean is commonly used to determine the performance of an investment portfolio over time. Technically, the geometric mean is defined as the nth root of a product of n numbers. The geometric mean has six characteristics. One, it is more accurate than using the arithmetic mean for calculating the average rate of change over time. Two, the geometric mean is always less than or equal to the arithmetic mean. Three, the geometric mean uses all the data. Four, the geometric mean is not distorted by outliers. 5. The geometric mean is not affected by fluctuations in the data. 6. All values must be non-negative numbers. This characteristic is a limitation. As we shall see in Chapter 6 of Clearsighted Statistics, the solution is to use index numbers. The geometric mean is the nth root of a product of values. Calculating the nth root by hand is difficult. Excel's GeoMean function makes calculating the geometric mean easy. The GeoMean function has one argument, the cells with the random variables. Here we have four annual interest rates for an investment. Year 1 equals 15%, year 2 equals 12%, year 3 equals 9%, and year 4 equals 7%. What is the average rate of return for these four years? The geometric mean is 10.32%, which is more accurate than the arithmetic mean of 10.75%. To repeat, the geometric mean is always less than or equal to the arithmetic mean. Here we have four annual interest rates, 15%, 12%, 9%, and negative 5%. Yes, in year four, the investment lost 5% of its value. Because of this negative number, the geometric mean cannot be calculated. Remember the sixth characteristic of the geometric mean. The geometric mean cannot be calculated using negative numbers. In the Chapter 6 lecture, we shall see the solution to this problem is to use index numbers, because index numbers are never negative. The last measure of central location that we will cover is the trimmed mean. The trimmed mean is also known as the truncated or adjusted mean. The trim mean function removes the distortion of outliers by cutting a predetermined percentage of the largest and smallest values. Excel makes calculating the trimmed mean easy. Excel's trimmed mean function is trim mean. This function has two arguments. The first is the cell range. The second is the percentage of values to be removed from the smallest and largest values. Here is an example of the arithmetic mean and three trim means. The arithmetic mean equals 40.69, as does the trim mean with 5% of the variables trimmed from each end of the data. The trim mean with 10% of the data trimmed from each end of the data equals 38.00 and the trim mean with 17.5% of the data trimmed from each end of the data equals 38.22. Let's turn to measures of dispersion. We will cover five of these measures. Range, mean absolute deviation, variance, standard deviation, and the coefficient of variation. 
The most basic measure of dispersion is the range. The range is the highest value in the distribution minus the lowest value. The weakness of the range is that it fails to use all the data in the distribution. Here again is the formula for the range. It is very simple. Range or R equals H minus L, where H is the highest value and L is the lowest value. Here is an example of the range for U.S. grocery sales for the period between 2017 and 1992. The range equals $303.57 billion, found by $641.04 billion minus $337.37 billion. Excel does not have a range function. But the range can be calculated using Excel's max function, which finds the largest variable, and the min function, which finds the smallest value. Cell C3 shows the result of combining these functions. The syntax is shown in cell D3. The next measure of dispersion is the mean absolute deviation. The mean absolute deviation, or MAD, is also known as the average deviation, mean deviation, and absolute deviation. Unlike the range, the mean absolute deviation uses all the data. The mean absolute deviation is the average distance of each value from the mean. Remember the third property of the mean. The sum of the deviations from the mean equals zero. The mean absolute deviation uses absolute values of the deviations from the mean to overcome the third property of the mean. Absolute values, in essence, convert negative values to non-negative values. The larger the mean absolute deviation, the greater the dispersion. The smallest possible mean absolute deviation is zero, which would mean all random values are equal. The formula for the mean absolute deviation is the sum of the absolute values of x, where x are the random variables minus the sample mean over the number of observations in the sample. The mean absolute deviation is calculated by hand with five steps. Step one, find the sample mean x bar. Step two, find the deviations of each random variable from the mean, x minus x bar. Step three, Find the absolute value of x minus x bar. Step 4. Sum the absolute values. Step 5. Divide the sum of the absolute values by the number of observations in the sample, or n. Excel's abdev function will calculate the mean absolute deviation. This function has one argument, the range of cells with the data. This table shows the age of the July 23, 2019 New York Yankees lineup. The average age was 27.89 years old. The mean deviation was 2.12 years. The mean absolute deviation is relatively unimportant and is rarely used in statistical analysis. Let's turn to variance and standard deviation. Variance and standard deviation are closely linked. Variance and standard deviation are the most important measures of dispersion for quantitative data. There are two measures of variance. The first is population variance, or sigma squared. Population variance is the sum of the squared deviations from the population mean divided by capital N, or the number of observations in the population. The second is sample variance, or S squared. Sample variance is the sum of the square deviations from the sample mean divided by lowercase n minus 1, where lowercase n is the number of observations in the sample. Lowercase n minus 1 is known as degrees of freedom. The formula for population variance is lowercase sigma squared equals the sum of x minus the population mean mu squared over the number of observations in the population. The formula for sample variance is S squared equals the sum of X minus the sample mean X bar squared over N minus one, where N is the number of observations in the sample. Variance is calculated by hand with five easy steps. Step one, 
find the mean. Step two, subtract the mean from each random variable. Step three, square the deviations from the mean. Step four, sum the squared deviations from the mean. Step five, divide by n for sigma squared or population variance, or n minus one for s or sample variance. Excel's two variance functions will save a lot of time compared to calculating variance by hand. To calculate population variance, use the var.p function and use the var.s function to calculate sample variance. The arguments for both functions is the cell range that contains the variables. This table shows the calculation of population variance and sample variance for the ages of the New York Yankees starting lineup from July 23, 2019. Population variance is 11.88 and sample variance is 13.36. But what do these numbers mean? They are not years, they are years squared. This is important. Variance is not typically reported when describing data. Variance is, however, used to calculate many important measures. The most important measure is standard deviation, which we will now turn to. There are also two measures of standard deviation. The first is population standard deviation, or sigma. Population standard deviation is the square root of population variance. The second is sample standard deviation, or s. Sample standard deviation is the square root of sample variance. Standard deviation is calculated by hand with six easy steps. Step one, find the mean. Step two, subtract the mean from each random variable. Step three, square the deviations from the mean. Step four, sum the square deviations. Step five, divide by n for population variance or sigma squared, or n minus one for sample variance, or s squared. Step six, take the square root of variance. Population standard deviation sigma is the square root of the sum of x minus mu squared over the number of observations in the population. Sample standard deviation s is the square root of the sum of x minus x bar squared over the number of observations in the sample minus one. Excel has two standard deviation functions, stdev.p for population standard deviation and stdev.s for sample standard deviation. These functions save time and the answers are a bit more accurate than those found calculating standard deviation by hand. In this example, the population and sample standard deviations are calculated for the age of the New York Yankees starting lineup for the game played on July 23, 2019. What is so important about standard deviation and why is it the preferred measure of dispersion? Standard deviation, unlike variance, is always in the same units as the mean. Let's recap variance and standard deviation. One, sample variance and sample standard deviation will always be larger than their equivalent population measures. This is because the denominator of the equation is n minus one, or degrees of freedom. This allows for sampling error. The advantage of standard deviation is that it is always in the same units as the mean. Variance is in the units of the mean squared. Variance, therefore, is not an important measure for describing data. But variance is very important because it is used in many calculations, including the standard deviation. Let's turn to the coefficient of variation, or CV for short. The coefficient of variation is a standardized measure of variation. The fact that it is a standardized measure allows for the comparison of variation with data measured on different scales. We will see the importance of standardized measures when we turn to null hypothesis testing and effect size measures. The coefficient of variation is the ratio of standard deviation to the mean. The coefficient of variation requires ratio level data. It cannot be calculated with interval data 
because interval data lacks an absolute zero, which makes the calculation of ratios impossible. The higher the coefficient of variation, the greater the variability. The coefficient of variation can be expressed as a decimal, percentage, or index. As previously mentioned, index numbers will be covered in detail in the Chapter 6 lecture. The formula for the coefficient of variation is very simple. Population standard deviation sigma over the population mean mu or the sample standard deviation s over the sample mean x bar. This example compares the coefficient of variation for the price of a Big Mac sandwich to monthly mobile data usage in gigabytes in 20 countries. The coefficient of variation for Big Macs is 34.29% versus 75% for mobile data usage. The variability for mobile data usage is nearly 2.2 times greater than that for Big Mac prices. Let's turn to the empirical or normal rule. This rule deals with the area under the normal curve. The normal curve is a symmetrical distribution that will be studied extensively in later chapters of clear-sighted statistics. The normal or empirical rule states that 68.26% of all variables are plus or minus one standard deviation from the population mean. 95.44% are plus or minus two standard deviations from the population mean. And 99.74% are plus or minus three standard deviations from the population mean. So, if the population mean were $1,000 and the population standard deviation were $100, 68.26% of the variables would be between $900 and $1,100, plus or minus one standard deviation. 95.44% of the variables are between $800 and $1,200, plus or minus two standard deviations. 99.74% of the variables are between $700 and $1,300, plus or minus three standard deviations. 0.13% of the variables are above $1,300, greater than three standard deviations. And 0.13% of the variables are below $700, less than three standard deviations. Let's turn to two measures of skewness the coefficient of skewness and kurtosis. Let's start with skewness. Skewness measures the asymmetry of a distribution. On the left is a continuous probability distribution, and on the right is a discrete probability distribution. Both distributions are symmetrical. They have no skew. The mean equals the median and the mode. Both of these distributions are right skewed because of the long tails on the right. Note the positions of the mode, median, and mean. The mode is at the peak of the charts because this is where the most commonly occurring values lie. The median is in the middle of the curve because it is not distorted by extreme values. And the mean is at the far right because it is distorted by extreme values. Both of these distributions are left skewed because of the long tails on the left. Note the positions of the mode, median, and mean. The mode is at the peak of the charts because this is where most commonly occurring values lie. The median is in the middle of the curve because it is not distorted by extreme values, and the mean is at the far left because it is distorted by extreme values. Pearson's coefficient of skewness was developed by Carl Pearson one of the most influential statisticians to have ever lived. Pearson's coefficient of skewedness measures the degree to which a distribution is not symmetrical. As we have just seen, skews can be towards the left or towards the right. Left skews have negative numbers and right skews have positive numbers. Pearson's coefficient of skewedness can be calculated using the mean, median, or mode. Using the mode, however, does not yield stable measures. Here is the formula for Pearson's coefficient of skewness using the median. The coefficient of skewness equals three times the sample mean minus the median over the sample standard deviation. This table shows how the coefficient of skewness is interpreted. 
Excel's skew function measures skewness, but it does not measure Pearson's coefficient of skewness. This function has one argument, the cell address that contains quantitative data. Kurtosis is another measure developed by Carl Pearson. Kurtosis measures the thickness of the tails in a continuous probability distribution. A normal curve is mesokurtic. Negative kurtosis means thinner tails than a normal curve and is called platycurtic. Positive kurtosis means thicker tails than a normal curve and is called leptocurtic. The curve on the left is mesokurtic. Its tails are considered normal. The curve in the center is platycurtic. Its tails are thin. The curve on the right is leptocurtic. It has thick tails. In addition to measures of central location and dispersion, there are also measures of relative position, which describe the placement of a particular value in a set of observations. These measures include percentiles, quartiles, deciles, quintiles, the five number summary, and box and whisker plots. Common measures of relative position include percentiles, quartiles, deciles, and quintiles. Percentiles divide rank ordered data into 100 parts. These values need not be actual values in the data. Quartiles divide rank ordered data into 4 parts. These values need not be actual values in the data. Quintiles divide rank ordered data into 5 parts. These values need not be actual values in the data. Deciles divide rank ordered data into 10 parts. These values need not be actual values in the data. Percentiles or centiles. The 75th percentile would be at the point where 75% of the values fall at or below this position and 25% of the values would be above it. The 50th percentile, P50, is the middle value of the data or the median. Every value in the distribution is at or below the 100th percentile. Here is the formula for calculating percentiles by hand. P sub i, with i standing for the selected percentile, equals the number of observations, or n, plus 1, times P sub i over 100. Here is an example of finding the 60th percentile. The first step is to sort the data. The second step is to count the number of variables, or n. In this example, n equals 12. The 60th percentile, or P sub 60, equals 12 plus 1 times 60 over 100. The answer is 7.8. The 60th percentile is 80% between the 7th variable 22 and the 8th variable 28. The 60th percentile is 22.8. Excel's percentile.exc function is much faster because there is no need to sort the data, and it can calculate the percentile for a large number of variables. As shown on this table, the percentile.exc function has two arguments. The first is the range of cells that has the data, and the second is the desired percentile. Quartiles divide that into four parts. Q1 corresponds to P25. Q2 corresponds to P50 as well as the median. Q3 corresponds to P75. Here is the formula for calculating quadrants. QI, the selected quadrant, equals the selected quadrant 1, 2, or 3 times n plus 1 over 4. In this example, we will find the first quartile. The first two steps are the same as finding percentiles. Step 1, sort the data. Step 2, count the number of observations. The first quartile equals 1 times the sample size 12 plus 1 over 4, which equals 1 times 3.25 or 3.25. The first quartile is 25% between the third item, 8, and the fourth item, 15. The first quartile is 9.75. Just like the percentile.exc function, Excel's quartile.exc function is faster because there's no need to sort the data 
and it will calculate the percentile for a large number of variables. As shown in this table, the quartile.exe function has two arguments. The first is the range of cells that has the data. The second is the desired quartile, one, two, or three. The first quartile is 9.75, the second quartile is 21, and the third quartile is 28.75. The inner quartile range is a variant of the range. It eliminates outliers by focusing on the second and third quartiles, or the middle 50 percentiles. The inner quartile range, or IQR, is defined as the third quartile minus the first quartile. Closely related to the inner quartile range is Tukey's five number summary. The five numbers are one, the median, two, the first quartile, three, the third quartile, four, the smallest value in the sample, five, the largest value in the sample. Outliers in the five number summary. Outliers are variables with very large or very small values that lie beyond where we would expect to find data. There are two categories of outliers, mild outliers and extreme outliers. Mild outliers are defined as the first quartile minus one and a half times the inner quartile range or the third quartile plus one and a half times the inner quartile range. Extreme outliers are defined as the first quartile minus three times the inner quartile range or the third quartile plus three times the inner quartile range. Box and whisker plots are graphic representations of the five number summary. Here's a box and whisker plot with one mild outlier and one extreme outlier. Outliers are separated by fences that mark the boundaries. The inner fence separates mild outliers from the rest of the data, and the outer fence separates extreme outliers from mild outliers. Let's construct a box and whisker plot for batting averages for the 2018 American League Division Playoff Series between the New York Yankees and the Boston Red Sox. This table shows the batting average for the series for players on both teams. This table shows the five number summary for each team. Lowest value, first quartile, median, third quartile, and highest value. It also shows the mean, number of observations, along with the inner quartile range, and outliers for each team. Here are the box and whisker plots for the Yankees and Red Sox. Based on these charts, it is not surprising that the Red Sox beat the Yankees. The box and whisker plots clearly shows the Red Sox out hit the Yankees. We will now turn to estimating the mean and standard deviation for group data. Data in frequency distributions are grouped. With frequency distributions, we lose the ability to calculate the mean and standard deviation precisely because we lack all the data. These measures, however, can be estimated. Here is a frequency distribution. We will estimate the mean and standard deviation. The formula for the mean, x bar, equals the sum of the class frequencies times the class midpoints over the number of observations, or n. The best estimate of the mean is $145.40, found by multiplying the frequencies by the class midpoints, summing the product of the frequencies times the class midpoints, to get 7,270, and then dividing by the number of observations, 50. The sample standard deviation is estimated by taking the square root of the sum of the frequencies times the midpoints minus the sample mean squared over the sample size minus 1. This table shows the estimate for sample variance, 272.31, and the sample standard deviation, $16.53. For this frequency distribution, the sample mean is estimated to be $145.40 with the sample standard deviation of $16.53. We will now review Microsoft Excel's Descriptive Statistics Data Analysis Tool. 
Excel's Analysis Tool Pack is Excel's plugin for statistical analysis. The Descriptive Statistics tool reports 13 statistical measures. This is a useful tool, but it needs an update. Here are the 13 reported measures. 1. The mean. 2. The standard error, which will be discussed in later chapters. 3. The median. 4. The mode. Unfortunately, this tool reports only one mode, which is why this tool needs an update. 5. Sample standard deviation. 6. Sample variance. 7. Kurtosis. 8. Skewness. 9. Range. 10. Minimum, which is the smallest value. 11. Maximum, which is the largest value. 12. Sum, which is the value of adding all the numbers. 13. Count, which is the number of observations. To launch the Data Analysis Tool, click on the Data Analysis Tool Pack icon on the Excel ribbon. Once you clicked on the Data Analysis Tool Pack icon, select the Analysis Tool, which in this case is Descriptive Statistics. The input screen will come up. Enter the input range, which is the range of cells that hold the data. Select whether the data are grouped in columns or rows. Check the box if labels are included in the first row. Select the output options. 1. A range of cells in the workbook. 2. A new worksheet. Or 3. A new workbook. Then click OK. Here is the output for our example. Column A shows the results for the Red Sox calculated using Excel's built-in functions. Column I shows the built-in Excel formulas except where otherwise noted. Clear-sighted statistics is licensed under a Creative Commons license. You are free to share derivatives of this work for non-commercial purposes only. Please attribute this work to Edward Volchak. You can access Clear-sighted statistics for free along with its Excel and PowerPoint files on the CUNY Commons. The URL is https forward slash forward slash cuny dot manifold app dot org forward slash projects forward slash clear dash cited dash statistics.